It's good to be back with you uh, this Lord's Day. We were thankful for the opportunity to be away on some vacation. Uh, last Sunday we were in Texas and sweating like crazy, um, but it's good to be back in Georgia heat. This is, this is good. Um, yeah, I was just thinking as we were singing that last, uh, last little vo- verse there, uh, we were just as a family, we went into Atlanta yesterday to do some stuff, and, and uh, we were driving down uh, Terra Boulevard and the cemetery there on the left as you're heading toward the interstate, and there was, um, uh, there was a casket that was the funeral. The, memor- the graveside had already happened, apparently, and they were lowering the casket into the ground, and I had just been considering this morning's message before we left the house, and then that scene just struck me as we were driving there. Um, just the, the weight of, of uh, our calling and how short life is. And we do not need to be messing around, church, um, that, that as we're going to pray in just a moment, the glory of the name of God needs to be the passion of this church because it's going to be what eternity is all about. And, and so forever we will, we will worship And we will be saying that Jesus is all to us. So let's pray together, church. Father, we do pray. I I beg you, God. I I plead with you, Lord, that, that the glory of your name would be the supreme, enduring passion of this church, Lord, this local church. That that our passion wouldn't be our preferences. Our passion wouldn't be music styles. Our passion wouldn't be some program in the church. Our passion wouldn't be our facilities. Our passion wouldn't be some cause. Our passion wouldn't be politics. But our passion would be the name that is above every other name. That the holy, your holy name, Lord, would be the supreme and abiding passion of this body. Lord, we... We desperately need you to continually revive us, Lord, so that's true. Because our hearts are so prone to wander after other things, not necessarily bad things, but lesser things than that supreme passion. And God, so would you just continually keep us, Lord, just fixed upon you. And even use this morning, God, to that end, even this little theme that we're talking about, God. It's looking unto Jesus, God. We want to look at you. We want our eyes to be fixed on you. Where else can we turn but you, Lord? And so I, I pray that you would keep us there and, 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 and that it wouldn't just, be, it wouldn't just be individually, but together, Lord, that is our confession, God. And Father, I, I pray that you, I know there's people that are here today that they've got a lot of other things that are drawing away their attention. I, my heart is heavy for the McGee's today, and I, I pray for them, God, as they wait. And I pray, Father, that, that the words of Psalm 27 would be theirs, that the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? I pray that they would, with David, God, wait for you. Be strong and and that their hearts would take courage, Lord, as they wait on the Lord. And I just thank you for just the testimony of Kyle, even in the foyer, God, that this seems to be where they're at. And I pray that you would continually uphold them, God, in the days to come. Father, we... We pray now, God, that you would help us as we look to your word, as we lay before, uh, as we put before us, God, today, just this, our hopes and our dreams and our prayer for this church, God. I pray that it would be used by you to draw us, um, to unite us together, God, in, in seeking, um, in seeking the aim that you've set before us, God, the, the purpose for which you've set us apart as a church, that you would, you would use this morning to that end, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in Ephesians 3 this morning, so you can turn there if you're not there already. Oh, good. It's working. We weren't sure if the... Okay. Yeah, that's right. Come on, Wade. Um, So we're in Ephesians 3. Um, But if you're a guest this morning, uh, and maybe if you've been out for some this summer and you've been out with us, I, I wonder if, but particularly if you're a guest this morning, we're very thankful you're here, and we trust that it's in God's good 
providence that you're here on this day. That said, this is not a normal uh, Sunday gathering for us. Our bread and butter as a church is to preach through books of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That is the long 40, 50 year history of that in this church and that will not change. And we, ex we explain the word of God and connect it to the stuff of real life. And that's what we want to do each, each Lord's Day gathering. And next Sunday, we will beginning, be beginning the gospel according to John, something I have been looking forward to for years now, to be honest. This has kind of been the carrot that's been dangling out in front of me for a long time and wanting to do some other things before that. Um, but John has written, the purpose of John is in John 30, verse, or 20, verse 31, so that you may believe that Jesus Christ believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. That is a message we desperately need to hear and to really come to grips with and lay hold of, church. And it's a message that we need to share because there's no other, there's no other way of having life apart from believing in Jesus Christ. There are people all around us that are dead in their sins and trespasses, and they need this message, and we need to be proclaimers of this message. But even us, church, it's not just that eternal life, that prospect of eternal life after death, but it's abundant life, John is going to make very clear. There is a lack of abundance, I confess, in my own life, and I, I so long to meet with Christ in the Gospels, that I would believe more deeply in Jesus, that He is the Son of God, and that I would have greater and a more abundant life in his name by believing. And that's my prayer for us as a church. So I encourage you to take extra time this week with whatever other devotional reading you do each day. But, but, but work through the Gospel of John. Try to do it in one week. If you want to take two weeks, next Sunday will be kind of an introduction. So if you put three chapters a day to do it in one week, you know, one and a half chapters a day to do it in two, I, I really encourage you to be good preparation. But the goal... This morning is, is a little different than normal. The goal is twofold. One, it's to update you on the process of long-range planning that we began back in March. Uh, we call it Vision 2020, this five-year strategic planning. Now, really, it began back in January. We had an elder retreat, and we had kind of have several ideas and things and possibilities for the year and a few years to come, and, and we were they were all great ideas, but... It kind of like, wait, let's hold back before we just start chasing this and this and this. Let's just really kind of step back and see things, the whole picture. Try to get a better grasp of what's going on. Where, are we, where do we need to grow? And, and, and before we start chasing these individual things, let's get a little more comprehensive uh, kind of view of where we're at as a church and where we want to be. And so that began us talking and praying and thinking and met with the deacons and elders for a dinner back in February and kind of laid these wrestlings and thoughts out before them. And so this is kind of what we came up with was this process to really intentionally plan for the future of the church. So I'm going to we're going to give an update on that this morning, and that'll be in this hour and in the next hour. And so I hope that you're able to be a part of that. Second purpose this morning is just to, again, it's to, related to that, but to galvanize us, to bring us close, to, to pray and to press on in seeking God's direction and power and wisdom for us as a church. And so not just information, but it's to bring us together. And that's what we'll look in Ephesians and pray that God will help us to that end. Uh, just a couple reminders, and for uh, I'm going to kind of we'll be weaving in and out the update and both of those purposes this morning. But just a couple reminders that we stated at the beginning of this process. The first thing is this: is what this is not. Now, this is not an attempt to be more organizationally savvy. We didn't read some hip new church book that said this is what you got to do, and 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 this is this is the key to. To, to church life and health and growth. That's not it at all. Secondly, it's, it's not masking some secret agenda that we're trying to push through. There's no, like, let, we want to do this, but let's just kind of do this whole process so we can get after one thing. That's not it at all. It's not because we're doing everything wrong and we need a complete overhaul. Uh, it's not. We, we look back on the history of this church with tremendous thankfulness for his goodness and grace here. And I'll say more about that at the end. What it is, it's just a recognition that there is this constant pull on churches to, to move away from that most basic mission that Christ has given us. I mean, I feel it, brothers and sisters. 
as a, as a pastor, I think all of our shepherds would share this, and, and I think you could probably say this too. It's easy to become busy doing generally good things, but, but forgetting that we exist for a singular Christ-given purpose. And, and we, the process, this process is to keep us aligned, keep us aimed, keep us moving where Jesus pointed us when he gave us a commission to make disciples of all nations. Now, that's what we really are hoping for through this process. And so we've, we have the process. We've, we tried to learn from other churches, like-minded churches that have done things like this. And we came up a process to help us pray and prepare and plan and think for the future. There are other ways of doing this. There are more formal, structured ways, far more formal, formal ways than we're doing it. There are far less formal and structured ways than we're doing it. And we're not saying we struck the perfect balance or this is the best way to do it, but this is, it's been helpful so far, I think. And so I just want to update you quickly on, on kind of where we're at in this process. And I'll put these behind you. The first thing that we did was just determine the process because we have never done this before, not to this extent. And so we looking and researching and see what other churches do. We shared that with you and we began preparation. So that was done. Then secondly, we, we needed to clarify our mission. What is the, I mean, again, we know the mission is not ours to make up. It's given to us by Christ. And so we, but we needed to, we needed to work with the words and state it in a way that, that we can, can really lay hold of it. The mission never changes. The mandate is Christ. It's why we've existed as a church. It's why we've always existed. It's why we always will exist as a church. So it's nothing new. It's just, it's just a, it's the only thing new is that we're isolating it and highlighting it and saying this is why we exist as a church. So we've finished that. We had a draft form of that in the survey, and, and your comments were very helpful. And so this is kind of the revision. I guess you could probably say it's still somewhat in draft form if you have other feedback. But we exist to glorify God by making disciples of Christ at home and abroad. That's why we exist, why we'll always exist as a church. Third step in the process was to to complete the survey analysis. And we, are, we had tremendous participation in this, and we are so thankful for that. I mean, we had, I think I told you, and I had a big stack, I think it was like 500 pages of, of data that came out of that survey uh, process. And so there were really helpful trends that emerged, just common things that were shared, strengths and weaknesses and kind of opportunities and those things. There were great ideas offered, and so it was very helpful. And, and it was invaluable when we, be, when we really worked to begin to identify what the kind of really key areas are for us as a church. Where do we really need to focus in this process? And so uh, I, know, I know some have asked about that survey data. When are we going to get the results? Well, we don't have the time in a year to just really <laughs> unload all of those results and unpack that. But what I can assure you, and you'll see this, is as we walk through the vision statement and as you'll get the kind of the strategic issues later, that is, that's what formed this, basically. Now, it's not that we were sticking our thumb in the air and seeing which way the winds of preference were blowing. As I let's just go there. But, but you, your input was great. You thought hard about these things. And it was really helpful. And so uh, it, it helped us form kind of and, and highlight the areas where we really needed to grow. So that was completed. Then we, we worked to set uh, the vision and strategic issues. And we first worked on identifying nine issues that we felt re really God was leading us to deal with. And again, a lot of that came out of that survey work. Nine is not a magic number. We didn't start. Let's find nine things. We, it, eight seemed too few as we began. Ah, we, we, there were just these nine that just kind of seemed everybody agreed. These are really important and, they're, and, and, and we need to work on these. And so that's where we settled. The issues, as you'll see, we'll pass these out at the end of the service. They're stated as questions that we want to be answered in the remainder of this process. So there, it's just us asking a question. How can we better do this? And then your help, and I'll talk more about this later, is going to be needed in answering that question. How do we begin to work on these things? But, um, but we'll, again, we'll pass out those answers. I'll, there's uh, just real quick, I can at least give you the categories of these answers there. We've, we've grouped them under gathering, growing, and going. So we under gathering, we have the Sunday gatherings, multicultural diversity, facilities campus, discipleship, biblical community, guest welcome and integration, and then... Um, evangelism, outreach, and world missions. They're not, 
They're not equal in weight. Those aren't ranked in priority. That's not, what we're t that's not how they're listed. Um, and we'll explain more about that later. So after that, we began crafting a statement of vision. So the vision statement uh, is, or excuse me, the mission statement is what we're to do. This is why we exist. The vision statement is where we want to be in five years. What do we want to be like as a church? And so most of these points in the vision statement that's, that's printed in your bulletin, they're connected to these strategic issues that we, that we have uh, highlighted. And so I, I think one way I've thought about this is basically how we're praying for our church. This is areas, this is a useful prayer, God, and I hope that you'll use it accordingly. Um, all right, the, the, and so the, the fifth step is where we're at right now. And it's to form working groups to begin to develop ministry plans. And this is where, this is where we're at now, and this is where your involvement becomes even more critical. Uh, we, we need your involvement to pray and to consider how we can begin to address these nine questions that we've laid before, that we'll be laying before you. This is where the real work begins and we need your help. And so during the Sunday school hour, we're going to talk with those about those strategic issues and, and get to have an opportunity for you, at, you to ask questions. And then we're going to talk about what these working groups, how they'll function, what the makeup of them will be, and uh, what the expectations of a member will be. And so uh, we, want, we want as many of you as possible to be a part of those groups. So please stick around and, and learn more about that. And whether or not you're interested in serving on one of these working groups, again, it'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions and hear questions that other people have related to these issues. And so, so that's where we're at now. And then and obviously in 2016, we begin implementation over the next five years. So that's the process that we've been through so far. And that's what's ahead. It's a good process, I think. Again, uh, it's not the only way to do this, but I think it's been helpful. I think the statement of vision is helpful. I think, um, I think these nine strategic issues are really useful to identify them as we have. But if we think that strategic planning is the thing we need most as a church, we are dead wrong. <laughs> but what we need most is God. We need Him. We need, we need the living head of the church to lead us. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us, to guide us, to empower us, to convict us and all of his ministries and in and among us. We need, we need the Lord. We're not asking God to put his stamp of approval on our little vision and our little plans. It's not what we're doing. We're asking him and looking to him and keeping our eyes fixed on him to help us stay tethered to Christ and to his mission. That's what we're after. Any, and any good thing that happens over the next five years and beyond the next five years through this church or in this church, all of it will happen. All of it's from God and all of it and, and will result in God being glorified. He gets all the glory. And so this morning we're going to look at two brief verses in Ephesians chapter 3 that help us think rightly about this process as we move forward. And we're just going to squeeze these two verses for just a little bit and let the juices of them kind of just soak into our pores as a church this morning and let that, let that affect how we think about uh, where we're at and where we're headed as a church. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. You can words are on the screen if you're not there. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The first word there, now. Now. And that word now is connecting this doxology to what He's just Said. And so the context of these two verses is prayer. It's Paul's prayer for the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 19. He said in verse 14, For this reason I bow my knees. For this reason I'm praying to the Father. What reason? It's, the reason is everything he's written about in the first three chapters of the letter. Now, we're not going to read through the first three chapters, but... We just say what's motivating Paul to pray for the Ephesians. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, it's everything he understands about God's power and love at work through Jesus Christ and displayed in Christ that moves him 
to pray this over-the-top, supercharged prayer for, for the Ephesian believers. I just say a word of application to us. Our prayers are a reflection of our view of God and our confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If, 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 if we have small thoughts of God and of His grace, that will be reflected in just weak, tepid, repetitious praying. And I'm convicted by that statement. But notice what he prays then. He prays again this over-the-top prayer, verse 16 of Ephesians 3, that according to the riches of His glory, that little word according to there, that is what he's saying, is to the extent that God is glorious. That's enormous. According to the riches of His glory, that He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit, through the second person of the triune God in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts, that He may make Himself at home in your hearts, not just kind of live for a little bit, but make Himself home in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. <laughs> Prayers don't get much bigger than that. You put most of my praying next to that, I'm like a little kid, a little whiny kid asking for a piece of candy. And he's just huge. But he's not done praying yet. He finishes his prayer with this doxology. And the reason Paul can make these seemingly audacious requests of God it's because, he, because of what he understands about God's power. By verse 20, his heart is soaring. Don't read this little kind of mellow, calm, predictable sort of way what he's saying here. This is not a literary device to transition to his next thought in Ephesians. It's not how these doxologies serve. This is Paul with exuberance shouting, Glory! As he thinks about the incredible power of God, unmatched, unfathomable power of God to do anything, he just breaks forth in praise. And I want to connect this prayer and this doxology into the context, into our context this morning. And I ask you, I, I plead with you to make the connection between this doxology, this prayer, and your own life and whatever you're going through but I want to connect it particularly to our church and what's going on right now. So I'll just make, I think, five statements as we squeeze this passage this morning. The first thing I would say is that God is able. Now to Him who is able. Paul's praying and Paul's praising isn't most deeply rooted in God's activity, but in God's ability. That's enough. That's enough to praise God. It's not just what God, God does that makes Him worthy of, of praise, but it's, it's what God is able to do that makes Him worthy of praise. And you think about your life, you think about this church, and it doesn't really matter what happens over the next five years, if we're to be honest. Maybe none of these things we're praying about, and none of these things we've highlighted in this vision statement come to pass as we think they should but God will still be worthy of all glory and all honor and all praise. <laughs> because His praiseworthiness isn't dependent upon what He does, but upon what He's able to do. Now, thankfully, God, and that's the next thing that we'll say. Let me just go to the next statement here. I better put these up here. I forget. Oh, thank you. You guys got my back. Oh, see, I messed you up now. Um, ah! All right, I'm, I'm leaving it. I'm done. All right, I'll come back later. I'll take the wheel later. Um, but it's not just what God is able to do, or what God, that God is able, but the second thing is God is able to do. To do. Now, to him who is able to do, that is a simple but important and very profound truth this morning. God is a doing God. It's not just that he did things in the past. It's not just that he will do things in the future. But God is presently, actively doing things now. God does. God is active, not passive. Because 
God is living, not dead. He's real, not imaginary. He's, he's involved, not aloof. He's strong, not, not tired and worn out. He's working, not idle. He's awake. He's not dozing. He's present, not distant. God, God is a doing God. He didn't make everything a creation and then just walk away and just kind of observe from a distance and then break back in in the incarnation and then be born and live and then die and rise and then go back and just kind of watch and see how things unfold. No, Christ is present and active. He's working tirelessly to build his church. Jesus is the living head of his living body. He is with us now by the Holy Spirit. God is a doing God. So if our, if our God is a God that does things, what is, he, what is it that he's able to do? That's what he goes on to ask. But just hold off there. If, if we can just get that simple point alone, God is living, active, working, doing. That can change most of our lives. If you just think about that, live like that. That will affect how you pray. That will affect how you, how you work. It will affect how you are when you come to the assembly. It will affect how you teach your Sunday school class. It will affect how you engage in small group. That will affect how you interact with your neighbors. It will affect how you share the gospel. Just get that, that God is a doing God. But third, squeeze it a little more. God is able to do more. Now that's capital, all caps more, with as many exclamation points as you can squeeze on your page. I'm summarizing what's gonna, what he's going to say in these verses. How much, just related to our context, how much can God do over the next five years in and through this church? He can do more. He can do more. How much can he do in your life? He can do more. But it's not just more. He's able to do, the text says, far more. And not just far more, but far more abundantly. That word abundantly is a great word. And, and the English language hardly does it justice here, but it's very descriptive in the Greek. And Paul basically makes up a new word here. He crams three words together into one. And he, and he's just, he cannot say this strongly enough. I was, I, it, it doesn't just mean... Lots and lots more. Uh, the, the lexicon that I looked at, it says, they, they define it as this. It means a super abundance, both in quantity and in quality. So God is able to do far more super abundantly in quanti quantity and quality. That's what he's saying. Now again, if we, if we just stop there, that is enough to break up the frozen seas of our prayer lives. And many of us have. Remember, this is in the context of prayer. So through the Spirit, by virtue of Christ's work on our behalf, we have free and open access to the Father who is able to do far more super abundantly in quantity and quality. That's incredible. We got to call upon that God. He's, uh, his, his ability is unlimited. But that's not all. God's ability isn't just limited to what we ask for. Thankfully, His working isn't restricted by our requesting. Because our requests are often so small. It says, but God is able to do far more super abundantly in quantity and quality than He says, than all we ask. And all we ask. One other pastor said, we want dessert and we need meat. We want success when we need humility. We want safety when we need godly courage and Christ-like sacrifice. We ask within the limits of human vision, but He is able to do more. He sees into eternity what is needful for our soul and for the souls of those whom our lives will touch across geography and across generations. And seeing this, He is able to do more than we ask. That's good. There are things... They we're asking God for in this church. 
We ask God for purity of doctrine. We ask God for purity of life. We ask him for unity. We ask him for directions. We ask him for broken relationships to be restored and reconciled. We ask for new disciples to be made, and we should ask for those things. But God knows and does far more than we'll ever ask him for. He's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask. But that's not all. This is just crazy. God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or even think or imagine, your text may say. There are those things that we think about and we lay in bed at night thinking about but we never ask God for because it seems, it seems like he he can't do it or he won't grant it. It's too big. But is there anything big to God? Can we ever outthink or outimagine God? God's ability to do more surpasses not just our asking, but even our imaginations, our thinking. 1 Corinthians 2 9 No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. What is, what is God able to do here and in your life over the next five years? The answer, far more super abundantly, both in quantity and quality, than all that we ask or even think. I mean, I confess this vision statement that's in the bulletin, it may not look big, it's, it's big to me. It seems big. And, and, and it's how I'm praying and how I invite you to pray for the church. But God is able to do more, far more abundantly. Now, one quick caution. God's, God, God doesn't measure bigness like we do. That, that don't see big through your Western eyes. See you big through the eyes of the lens of Scripture. Sometimes God does big things in very small and unnoticeable ways. And we just, we don't have the benefit. You look at all kinds of examples in Scripture. It's these little, think of like Ruth. Just a story there. And what God, the big things God is doing in very inconsequential, humanly speaking ways. And, and we're not setting up some standard that God has to meet or exceed in, in, in order to be for him to be successful. That's not it. We're playing, praying, planning, thinking, preparing. But our eyes are on God to ask and asking him to do even far more than we've thought about or prayed about. That's what we're looking for. And God is able. That's the point I want to say is God is able to do everything else. That's, what, that's what's driving Paul to praise, praise the Lord is just God's ability. It's unlimited. And may that encourage our hearts as we launch forward in this process. The fourth, fourth thing we're going to squeeze from this, these two verses is that God is able to do more powerfully and personally. He's able to do these things according to the power at work within us. This super abundant ability, this unfathomable power of God is at work, the text says, within us. Within us. How is God's power were at work within us by the Holy Spirit, by the second person of the Godhead. The same Spirit that hovered over the surface of the waters at creation. The same Spirit that gives life to all men. The same Spirit who's omnipresent, whom David said, where can I go from your Spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? The same Spirit by whom the Scriptures came and the prophets spoke and we have this Word, the same Spirit that opens our eyes to understand this Word, the same Spirit that opens blind eyes and makes the dead live, the same Spirit that led and empowered Jesus Christ during His ministry on earth, that same Spirit lives in you if you're in Christ. That's incredible. He's not a lesser version of the Holy Spirit than Jesus had. He's not a old, outdated version like some of our software. He's not a watered-down version. He's not a JV version. The Holy Spirit of God is at work powerfully within you. Within us. That's a plural pronoun there. God, by the Holy Spirit, God is personally and powerfully working within us. 
Now, does it feel like that always? Does it feel like that in your life today? If you're not feeling it, I encourage you to think about who you are in Christ. And I want you to look with me. Ephesians chapter 1. And you, I don't even care if you read along or if you just want to close your eyes and listen as I read these words. But let them, whatever, however helps you pay attention. Ephesians 1 verse 13. No, excuse me, verse 3. Listen to this statement of where, who we are in Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. Listen what is ours in Him. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. And you can go on in Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 3 and you see all that unfolds out of that reality. If you are in Christ, then that is true of you. And if that's true of you, then are you going to doubt for a second that God is going to powerfully, that God is powerfully and personally at work within you? to do far more super abundantly in quantity and quality than all that we ask or even think. What gall to, to accuse God of not being at work in you when that's what the extent to which He's shown His love for you and what He's done to make you His own. So I encourage you, look, let the gospel of Jesus Christ wash over you and, and, and so that you begin to see the reality that the Spirit of God is present within you, working mightily within you in ways that you can't even conceive. That's reality. Last statement. Just building on that, in verse 21, God is able to do more powerfully and personally so that He gets all the glory. This is a doxology. In verse 31 ends, he, He's... he's he just kind of breaks the thought up to him. Now to him, and then he goes on and describes this him, this God, and then he comes back to him, to that God, the God who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Whatever God does in this church over the next five years or over the next five minutes, all glory belongs to God. Glory is His. His glory in the church. The God is glorified uniquely in the church, not, not, because there's, not because of the glory of the church, but it's glory in the church. The church is a reflection of God's enormous, incre incredible glory. You go to the Grand Canyon, my... Uh, nieces were there yesterday. My brother and his family were, were there for the last few days. We saw the pictures on Facebook. And if you've been there, you know the pictures don't do it justice, but the pictures themselves are incredible. You say, wow, this is, it's not, it's not the glory of the Grand Canyon. It reflects the glory of the Creator who made it. And, and in a far greater way, the church is this this reflection of, of the glory of God, and it's uniquely so. And what does that mean for us? It means all kinds of things. But let me just highlight one thing that that means for us today, that the church then is not, it's not optional. It's not, a, it's not like the dessert at Piccadilly where you can take it or leave it 
And you can still get a meal without it. No, it's not optional for the Christian. That we can't glorify God rightly apart from being involved in the local church. There's glory in the church. That's where He gets glory. The individualistic idea of Christianity today that's so popular, it falls way short of what God desires from His children. And that we, there's glory in this, in our lives brought together for the common purpose of glorifying Him and making disciples of all nations. We should, we should also long to see our church a better reflection of His glory. That's why we need to pray for revival in the church, in, our, in this local church, in the wider church. We need to burn hot and bright for Christ. So there's glory in the church, glory in Christ. You can't separate the head from the body. That, that the church is the theater of God's glory only and to the extent that it's in Christ. Glory in Christ and glory forever throughout all generations, forever and ever. That's very emphatic. And, and, and the weight of that expression, I realize, is easily lost on us. We've heard forever and ever and eternity and those just kind of become benign words to us, but they shouldn't be. But we're not talking about a hundred years, not a thousand years, not 10,000 years, not a million years, but forever and ever and ever and ever. It's all going to be about His glory in Christ. We need to be about now what we'll be about for an eternity. God's glory is ultimately why we exist as a church. That's why we've stayed in the mission as we have. We exist to glorify God by fulfilling the mandate that Christ has given us of making disciples of Christ at home and abroad. We don't exist to keep the lights on. We don't exist to, to, to fund a budget. We don't exist to, find, to, to have and offer safe alternatives for families and children. We don't exist for our own self-approvement. God is to be the blazing center of everything we are as a church. It's His glory, the glory of His name, that's got to be the passion of this church. And then together, the, the prayer ends, we proclaim, Amen. Let it be so. Let it be so. That's not the... It's not just how you end a prayer. That's just this affirmation, this corporate affirmation. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. May that be true of us. Well, just a couple quick applications, and then we're going to work through the vision statement and, and just brief and basically read through it. I may make a few comments. But in light of this passage, in light of God's superabundant ability to do far more than we ever ask or think, I just a couple of warnings to us, and these you can yeah thank you. Let's not be guilty of a church as a church of not having because we will not ask. In the book of James: If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all. And Psalm eighty-one ten of to Israel, the Lord said, "I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Open your mouth, ask." We need to seek the Lord, call upon Him. Secondly, like, let's not be guilty as a church of not having because we doubt God's ability or willingness to give. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. As the loving Father, He will give good gifts to His children when they ask. Matthew 7, 1, 11. We, we don't always understand God's ways or His purposes, but we should never doubt His ability to give and to do what's best for us. I, I just thinking of the healing of that the, the boy who's oppressed by this demon, the father bringing the son. He says, "You if you can do you can do if you can do anything, have compassion on my son." And Jesus' response is, "If you can." It's a mild rebuke to this father. And then the father responds, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Oh, that's where we need to be at, Lord. We believe you're able. Help us. Third, let's not be guilty as a church of praying 
small prayers. Pray big prayers. Philip Brooks, he said, pray the largest prayers. You cannot think of a prayer so large that God, in answering it, will not wish you had made it larger. Pray not for crutches, but for wings. Pray big prayers, sweeping prayers. Finally, let's not be guilty as a church of asking God only for things that are humanly explicable. Don't be like the disciples trying to scrounge up 200 denarii so they can barely meet the needs of the hungry crowd. Pray for the Lord to multiply, multiply a few loaves and a few fish so that he gets all the glory. That's how we need to be thinking and praying. Pray for the powerful, powerful conversion of many sinners. Pray for the, quote, hopeless marriages to be rest, restored and renewed in this church. Pray for believers who are trapped in habitual sin to be rescued and brought out of that and made holy. Pray for severed relationships that seem irreconcilable to be healed. Pray for bitter brothers and sisters who are just holding on to a grievance. Pray that they would come to know forgiveness and to forgive others and to be filled with the joy of the Lord again. Pray for just a slew of young people to come out of this church and maybe older people to go that say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the ends of the earth, going to hard places to share Christ with those who don't yet know Him. Pray for that to happen. <laughs> with that in mind, I want to draw your attention to the statement of vision that's in your bulletin. You can pull that out and it'll be on the screen if you happen not to receive one when you came in. And this is how, again, this is how I want us to begin to be praying and for our church. Pray big sweeping prayers. Make these prayers. This is the kind of stuff that, that, that Jesus would say, it's not just prayer, it's prayer and fasting that's needed to see these things become reality. Maybe that's, that, that's I, I, as we get into these working groups, I think that's probably where we need to begin. Seeking the Lord, desperate for Him. Let me just make a, a preliminary remark before we work through this statement. The, what I want to say is the statement is not, or excuse me, the statement about our hopes and futures as a church is not in any way a rebuke of the past. It's not, it's not what this is. It's not we've been doing it all wrong, now we need to start doing things right. That's not, that's not it. God has blessed us far beyond what we ever would deserve in this church over the last 50 years. Many have gone before us and many are laboring now to give us the solid foundation upon which we're continuing to build. And so... So this is God's mercy, and it should cause us to just overflow with thanksgiving to God for His grace and His faithfulness to us as a church. And so I hope that, I hope that you see that. I mean, Paul, as he prayed these big sweeping prayers in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, it, it comes after he expressed to God in praying and thanksgiving to God for the, both for their faith in Christ and their love for all the saints. He was filled with thankfulness for this church as he then prayed these huge prayers for them. And so that needs to be the posture of our lives. The only way we can... I mean, it's God's grace that we're able to even do something like this that the that, church is of, of, it's of such health that we can even begin this process with the joy that we are engaging in it. And then secondly, I always remember this is where... Also, remember this is where, oh, excuse me, I went too far. This is where we want to be in five years. So remember, mission statement is what we always will be doing. This is what kind of church we want to be a part of in the next five years. This kind of church we want our kids to grow up in. And again, not that these things aren't at all present by any means, but we see the need for growth in these areas. So the, the first, the vision statement begins with kind of an opening uh, preamble. We're trying to package everything basically in the statement into one into one statement, one sentence, and it's this. It's to be a Christ-centered, Bible-rooted, Spirit-led, gospel-proclaiming, disciple-making, life-sharing, culturally diverse, unified, actively growing fellowship of disciples of Jesus Christ from across the South Metro Atlanta area that gathers together for worship, grows together through discipleship, and goes together with the gospel to our community and world. Now, that's a mouthful. We're not expecting you to memorize that. I can't memorize I won't be memorizing that. Uh, but that's just kind of the...
broadest picture of, of as we think and pray. And this is a draft. Let me just say that also. So we welcome feedback. If you think of better ways to say some of these things, I mean, not, I'm not saying we haven't worked hard on this, and we've spent a lot of time in wording this as it's worded, but it's still in, in somewhat of a draft form, and so we do welcome your feedback. And then there are, there are two introductory kinds of statements, more general statements, and it's this. The first one is, we desire simplicity of ministry so that our church remains focused on its most, most basic mission of making disciples to the glory of God. And what we're saying is the hope and the vision for this church is not to have a bulletin that's just chock full of events every day of the week, stuff happening here on campus, and this ministry, and this activity, and this program, and all this stuff going on. That is, I'll confess, that is not the church I want to be a part of. That sounds exhausting. Uh, what we're looking for, if anything, is simplicity. What can we do so that we don't lose sight of that most basic mission that Christ has given us? And so, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that there won't be ministries and events and programs that, and some things we do differently, some things we do away with, some things we add. So I'm not saying that none of that is going to happen, but, but the, the purpose is to keep things simple so that we are streamlined and focused on what Christ has pointed us towards. And then second... Uh, two, we, didn't, we need the wisdom, direction, and powerful working of God's Spirit to see these things and more accomplished to the glory of God. That's where we were at this morning. I tell you, I'm just going to step over to the side so I can kind of keep an eye on the screen as I, as I uh, talk. All right, so then we get into, we've broken the vision statement up into these three categories of gathering, growing, and going. And I'm basically going to read these, and, and, and we'll, I'll give you a break. I know I've talked a lot already this morning. But first, gathering. The Lord's Day gatherings being times of biblical, authentic, wholehearted, spirit-filled corporate worship and fellowship. This is, this is a core part of what we do is gathering. This is part of what it means to be a church. A congregation and leadership that increasingly reflect the diversity of our community. A campus and facilities that accommodate future growth and support the mission and priorities of the church. And then undergrowing. Preaching and teaching ministries that stir hearts through the truth of God's word to know, love, and serve Christ in all of life. Discipling relationships forming and flourishing throughout the church. And I just say, again, I hope as you... As these statements come, that many of the comments that you stated and were stated over and over in that survey, they're reflected in these things. That was one of the things that was uh, just resounded through that survey was just the desire to see older and younger together in discipleship and people, dis meaningful relationships where the truth of God's word is brought in and connected to life and that kind of stuff. And so that's what we're looking for there. The church being a growing family to whom, we depend, to whom we belong and on whom we depend. The church is not just a place you go. It's not just an event you attend. It's a family. It's something we're a part of. And that's, we want to see that more and more expressed. Meaningful community life being expressed through church-wide small group participation. We talked, Eric handled this well last week, just the need for us to, to live as community as we carry out this mission. Trained biblical counselors helping to connect God's unchanging truth to the problems of life in the context of loving relationships. Members of the flock taking the initiative to actively care for one another as needs arise, not just depending upon the, the, the staff or a few people to, to meet needs, but, but relying upon the body caring for one another more so. And then finally, undergrowing church and ministry leaders who better know, love, feed, lead, feed, and care for those in our flock. And then finally, undergrowing five statements here. Growth coming largely from the making of new disciples of Christ as we share the gospel with others. That's how we want to see that if the church is going to grow, we want to see it, see it made, grow through that, through evangelism. Families and individuals living on mission with gospel intentionality wherever they are. We've talked a lot about that this summer. The church extending the blessings of Christ to meet community needs, local outreach in our community. Raising up, sending out, and actively supporting numerous short and long-term missionaries. And a church full of global-minded Christians, Christians committed to making an impact on the nations for the gospel. For the gospel. 
Is that a church you want to be a part of? I'm, I'm, I mean, that gets me excited and that to, to pray and to seek God for that. And I'm thankful we're a part of that church who, I mean, I'm not saying this would be brand new for us. So many of those things are already, again, at work now, but may God help us to excel still more. What's next? And just a couple of things. One, continue to pray. We need, we, 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 this is why we themed it looking to Jesus. We want to keep our eyes on Christ. So not the, it's not the workings of man and the plannings and plottings of men it's that we need. It's we need, this, we need God. We need his, his, him to work in us. Secondly, read the vision statement. Read it carefully. We're going to pass out. I tell you what, guys, you can go ahead and come forward, Kyle, if you want to get your uh, men together. We're going to pass out those strategic issues, those nine issues. And, and so it's a longer document. And I knew if I gave it to you earlier, you wouldn't have listened to me at all this morning. So uh, that was sort of selfish. But, um, but uh, they're going to pass those out, and one per couple, maybe your family. Uh, if, you want, if you each want one, that's fine. There's plenty. Um, but, but those guys are going to pass those out. So, so read the vision statement. Read these issues. Think of questions, clarification that you need. Again, it's all still, we're, we're not claiming we've got everything just perfect. And so you may have thoughts and ideas. So we've worked hard at the, the wording of these. So what you'll find in that is a statement of the issue. And again, in the form of a question, a description of that issue, and then uh, a few points in terms of if we don't address this, what potential consequences might be of failing to address that. So that's what's included in in this document. And then finally, uh, stay around. I, I do urge you to stay around for the next hour during the Sunday school hour. I know uh, the ladies class, there's a fellowship and we are, we're, we're video recording both the service and the next hour will be video recorded and, and there'll be audio with the slides and everything that's presented. So if you need to go, if you have a pre previous commitment and the children's classes will be meeting except for the fifth and sixth grade boys will be up here because Ron's their teacher and uh, he'll need to be up here for this. Um, and so, but all the other children's classes will be meeting as usual. So I know you teachers will, will be missing out, but we'll have this available to you uh, as soon as we can. And so you can watch that. But, but I would encourage all, all, everybody else that's not already um, ha committed elsewhere to stay around for the next hour. And uh, we'll walk through those strategic issues. We'll give you an opportunity to ask questions and try to answer those as best we can. And then uh, we'll talk about kind of what the next steps are, what it would look like to be involved in one of these working groups. Uh, so that's, that's, that's where we're at, church. And uh, we, are, we are excited and thankful to be where we're at in this process. This seems so far off and so daunting back in, okay, it still seems a little daunting, I'll, <laughs> if I'm honest. Uh, we, we still have a lot of work to do. In some sense, the work's really beginning now. Um, but, uh, but, but this is, this is good. And we're looking to the Lord for these things. So I want to, let's stand together. We've been reading and looking at a doxology. Let's stand and let's sing the doxology together. I, I realize some of you may not know these words, but, but, but if you don't just sing along, uh, listen as we sing together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Back up here in about 30 minutes. We have